There's enough noise in the world. We don't need any more noise. But you can never have enough stories. <laughs> Lorna McGee, thank you so much for being on Flute Unscripted. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here. And I did want to talk with you a little bit more uh, about the Bennett family, uh, because I think when people hear of you and you're playing, uh, they kind of know your connection to that family and it all kind of makes sense. So I did want to talk a little bit more about um, your studies with William Bennett um, and his wife, Michi, and uh, talk a little bit more about your um, first flute and piano album released uh, on Michi's record company, Beep, as well, um, and your mm -hmm. affiliation with Altus. So can you talk a little bit more about them and their influence on you? Yes. Uh, I, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to both Michi Bennett and, and William Bennett. So uh, when I was uh, 17, I went down to London to study at the Royal Academy of Music. Um, and you know, I studied there for four years, and my first year was with Michi. Um, and Michi is a wonderful player and an incredible teacher, like a, such a gifted teacher, and a very demanding teacher. I was not allowed to play any pieces for my whole first year. Wow! <laughs> Which actually, looking back, that was that what a was, gift to you. Yeah, but that was that was really tough. You know, I, I'm not. I'm not sure I would be courageous enough to ask my students to do that, but it gave me such a such an incredible technical grounding, you know, so Michi was kind of a bit of a taskmaster, but in a wonderfully detailed, helpful way, you know, so that really gave me a foundation to then um, spend the next three years studying with William Bennett, where everything is about storytelling everything is about bringing the music to life and animating it and and telling a story and um taking delight in the music and so it's so great to come at that with with really strong technical foundation so that the things technical things are not holding you back and you could just embrace that wholeheartedly because that's what he was interested in teaching and uh, you know, how to play a melody, how to really sing through a melody, how to make graceful phrase endings, how to reach the peak of a phrase and how to use your vibrato to enhance your phrasing, um, you know, all of these wonderful things and how to do different tone colors to create atmosphere, to, to draw the audience in and to really bring the music alive and to, it, it was just so imaginative and such great training. And of course, so William Bennett uh, comes from the tradition of Moise. And, uh, you know, certainly what he took from Moise is this very vocal tradition. You know, Moise was in the opera and would was inspired by great singers and, you know, trying to elevate the flute, not just from a sort of uh, uh, flashy, wonderful, sort of instrumental way of playing but to a very very human and very vocal you know we're so lucky on the flute we don't have a mouthpiece we don't have a you know like a trumpet or, or a reed yeah. to worry about it's just literally your breath is conveying the music so it's so close to singing so the lessons that i treasured that i to this day treasure the most are when you will play you know Melodies from Moise's book, A Tone Development Through Interpretation. I love that book. It's my favorite. Yeah. Isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. Yeah. So enjoyable. Or, or the 24 Easy Melodic Studies, you know, Moise's 24. So those are the lessons that are really imprinted. And then, you know, playing repertoire, it was all about bringing it to life and sort of applying, you know, even in your Mozart, applying the beautiful phrase endings, the love yous, you know, so you don't say love you, love you just like the inflection of speech and and things like that and yeah not elegant not elegant and um just finding ways to um use the breath like, like just get the breath to do exactly what you want to tell your story um and what an absolute delight so i feel like this this tradition of um song coming through your teachers really speaks through you and through your playing and through your teaching um, from University of Michigan to the University of British Columbia to Carnegie Mellon, um, do you feel like your teaching style um, has evolved over the years or do you feel like this is kind of a common thread and you have a pretty consistent philosophy towards teaching? This is a pretty uh, 
common thread through all of it. I mean, for me, the, the, the sort of storytelling aspect has always been there. That, that, that's what you want to awaken in a student. And like, like Michi, I want to give the students like really great technique that they can be able to tell their story without being hampered or without being hindered yeah. by then having to think of uh, finding ways through technical challenges, you know, take care of that outside the piece, you know, take care of that, you know, so, so there's the, there's the craft, which I'm really big on. And, and, and that for me, so just in terms of how my teaching has developed, in terms of the craft element, a big part of that for me is influenced by Alexander technique, finding, you know, ways to work where we're not working against ourselves. Sure. where we con continuously are refining the kinesthetic map and for me that's a lifelong challenge a wonderful lifelong challenge it's so interesting i i really enjoy it and you know finding ways to play with effortless effort so that so that when you come to tell your story also the audience is not distracted by your effort or your efforting or your um being flustered or, or anxious or, or you suddenly you switch off from being communicative because you're anxious about this technical passage it's yeah. so nice to just have your ducks in a row and then so then in terms of the like what i what i really want to teach is the storytelling but that craft is a huge part of it having that you, you can't you cannot it's not a duality it's not somebody's a technical player or they're a musical player no being a great artist is having great technique as well as that commitment to communicating to your audience you know if you care about communicating you care about the craft as yeah well. i so love too it, how you've described it i've heard you talk about this in relation to you know entrances on maybe a, a pianissimo high note and that you just have to feel comfortable and do your work beforehand to go in without any sort of fear because if if you have that it's going to be squeezed it's going to crack it's not going to work so you know, like you're kind of talking about, do the work beforehand, get your ducks in a row so you can come to the music stress-free, which is, I think, easier said than done. You probably feel- Well, that's exactly right. So, I mean, you give, you know, that example of coming in on a quite high entry, you know, just knowing exactly what the kinesthetic map is, knowing exactly what the airspeed is, knowing exactly what the angle of the air is, uh, hearing the beautiful sound in your head before you play. Yeah. So, so, so that is all stuff that, i mean you train in that you train religiously in that you train religiously in that and then another part of the training is is taming your own demons that are telling you oh, what if this not cracks yes. what if it's too sharp what if it's too this or this? so you have to train those demons get down <laughs> and and, and uh, just just okay the concert's going ahead you have to come in in this entry instead of thinking what if hear it beautifully in your head so those are the components that I try to teach craft, mental uh, uh, discipline, you know, mental skills. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that is informed by the Alexander technique because a lot of, you know, one of the main principles of Alexander technique is not end gaining. So you don't focus on grasping at a result. You don't focus, I've got to nail this passage or I have to win this audition or I have to win this competition. Instead, you just you cannot there's there's certain things you can't control the outcome of yeah. but you can control the quality of the way you breathe in you can control the quality of your fingers on the keys you know all of that is a and it's a discipline and and it's it it's very constructive so it's um if i were to distill my alexander training how i apply it to flute playing one sentence do not grasp do not grasp physically a lot yeah do not grasp with the breath, you know, no student breaths that are last minute and stressful and, and uncoordinated. Um, no grasping mentally, like, oh, I've got to nail this piece, or I've got to nail this piece. And, and so, so it's just the whole, I mean, if you would just distill it to one thing, that's, and it's not easy to do. And it, and no. it but it takes discipline and it's so empowering. It's so empowering because then you, you remain in your own, how you're meaning your own sovereignty you're not you're not kind of what if this or what if that no it's okay the concert's going ahead <laughs> let's, let's I love too. yeah i love too how you're talking about the importance of i mean you're sharing it with people as well and you um have said that you try to have this generosity towards your audience and not a fear of them 
um, which I think right. is really helpful to think about. And, and um, okay, so one of the things I love to do is watch, uh, this is geeky, but I love to watch masterclasses online and I love to watch uh, other players like violinists or especially singers. And my heroes are like Thomas Hampson or Joyce Di Donato. Yeah. I've learned so much from watching them. And one of the things that Thomas Hampson says is, you don't play to an audience, you play for an audience. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, you can feel even in your own body, you feel the difference in that. There's a more spacious uh, feeling playing for people. You know, it's so enjoyable when you when you are looking at music in that way, rather than trying to just get it right. Right. Um, it, it's so much more enlivening. And I think what has become more and more apparent to me in my teaching, and I, I kind of emphasize more and more is this business of being an artist of the breath. So really connecting with it, like your breath is the music. So often, often when players tend to think of the breath, it, uh, and flute players tend to think of the breath, they don't, they don't really think of it at all often, except in right. a technical sense, or, or like to put gas in the car to go from A to B. But if you actually really think about it, pair it right back, the breath is your music. Like that is your medium. That is what is carrying your message. So if people are familiar with the book Song and Wind by Arnold Jacobs, it's sort of taking that idea to the nth degree. Like, um, and how can you free up your breath? That's where all that Alexander training comes in. So you yourself don't block that beautiful river of air by, for example, having too much rigidity or, uh, or, or fear. You know, like for that breath to come out freely, um, the body needs to be spacious, open, your attitude needs to be spacious and open as well, and kind of fearless and courageous and um, open hearted. And that's hard in our business because we're often faced with rejection. Yeah. And, and, and I would say nobody is exempt unless you're Jeannie Packstress. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, we, we, we all get rejected. And so making a commitment to, to stay open, I know it's hard, but that's what's so beautiful about music. And um, so the artistry of the breath, a painter, their medium is paint, potter, clay. For us, it's the breath. And I just, I think it's so empowering. And then it's very wonderful as a teacher and, and with your student to tap in but can you animate the breath there? Or, or, or what are we doing that is not letting the breath move freely there? And it's so wonderful when you hear that freedom, you know, when a student gets it and the sound is just resonating in their whole system and, and it's alive. And this, that, that is the most rewarding thing about teaching. And frankly, that's what I, I listen for that in additions to, you know, I just want somebody to be alive in that, in, in what they're doing. I want to, I mean, speaking of Jeannie, uh, since you brought her up, mm -hmm. when you succeeded her in the, the faculty position at Carnegie Mellon uh, in 2015, what was that like? And did she have any words of wisdom for you? Every single word that comes out of her mouth <laughs> is a word of wisdom. <laughs> That's true. A word of wisdom. <laughs> um, so, you know, ju ju just to um, give the full picture, you know, uh, Alberto Almarza is is also a professor at Car Carnegie Mellon University, and so he and Jeannie taught for many, many years together, you know, I think the 16 years together. So they had such a great relationship and it's such a wonderful working relationship and a wonderful partnership and a very uh, they, had so, they had so much respect for each other and they had the, the way they set up the studio and the way that their attitude to the students, um, to the work was, trem it was tremendously inspiring. So when I first came in, I was just on the periphery of that. So there was one year when, when there were three of us there and I, I was just really on the sidelines, but I got a chance to see how they worked and to see even the way they conducted their auditions, you know, and to see the quality of attentiveness and care was really, really. I can speak from a firsthand experience because I, I auditioned for her, um, you know, I don't remember the year, but it, it was for her at Carnegie Mellon and 
remember that was actually one of the only college auditions I loved because she was one of the only people to give nice positive feedback I mean immediately afterwards and it was really kind when you're you know facing a lot of rejection and tough critiques and asking for critical comments to actually just get a voluntary nice comment even if they don't you know choose you in the end it was nice to hear kind words from her so that yeah. was really special no, there's a so there's a lot to learn there's a lot to learn and 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 just you know i've watched Jeannie and alberto a lot in master classes since i've been in pittsburgh you know we have the consummate flutist courses oh. here and so i've had a chance to observe and and you know i mean you just learn all the time from these people and then you know alberto is such a master teacher and the two of them and that you know how they talk about teaching so it i i feel incredibly fortunate to be to have been able to experience that and to be part of that and um you know one of the things that i i love about Jeannie's teaching is she 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 really puts people at ease so that they can do yeah. their best yeah. you know and it's uh, you know one of the things she'll say in master classes i'm not here to judge you i'm here to educate you you know and so she, she just has a wonderful way of helping people as does william bennett actually in a different way in a different way he's so playful and so uh well just, of course they're very they're different personalities but both of them have that skill of just disarming the student yeah. so that they enjoy the music and be their best and uh you know alberto is the same so it's great great to have um had the chance to i also wanted to talk about your your path to pittsburgh and the pittsburgh symphony um i think it's interesting that you did audition in, back around 2006 and it, it wasn't a good time for you um, you decided, you know, to kind of pass it up at the moment. Um, at that time, was that really tough to do? And do you advise your students or, you know, colleagues to take auditions too, if you think maybe it's it's not the right time? No. So, so I, that was like cutting your arm off. That was excruciating. Oh, yeah. I mean, that was like one of the toughest things to do. And and it's not. So just you know, going into it, you don't realize, you don't know that it's not the right type, like you explore things and yeah. then and then you get offered something and then you have to figure it out. And so, you know, it's just helpful for, you know, I, I'm sure most of the audience listening will be Americans. So it's just the immigration process is not straightforward yeah. and neither my husband nor I are American. So it would have meant, you know, it would have meant living apart for many years. And I'd already moved over from the from the UK to be together. So that like, why would I then voluntarily be apart? And the reason we would be apart is because it would take three years for me to get a green card. So I would be on an O visa, which meant that your spouse would not be allowed to work. Uh, and, and, you know, unless he had his own specific job here and there was nothing at the time. So do you see what I mean? It's not like going into it, I knew that it was not going to work out with all these other logistics but you know you explore something and then if you're lucky enough to be offered it then you sort of figure out what are the implications and then it, it actually just would have been catastrophic for our marriage and so already to have made that enormous decision to immigrate so to, to, you know to canada first of all and so i mean it was so believe me it was an excruciating decision and no i would not advise anybody to do any i mean my whole career has not you know it's been rather circuitous and there have been many times right. where i've thought about leaving music too you know and, and and in a way you know i've kind of dabbled in that and, and so it's always lovely to have the door open too you know like it's not a it's not a life sentence it's something you choose to do and um i i know that sounds I, I don't I don't mean that to sound to sound flippant at all, but that's something else I tell my students, you know, if they're finding it too stressful or if they're finding it if if you don't have like everything you do is on your own terms. Right. You know, if you decide to take this competition and it's stressful in the preparation, it, it's your choice. You don't have to do it. Right. Or or when you're taking professional auditions, you know, you can feel it, it can feel really horrible, but just somehow remembering it's it's your choice and you don't have to do it. You don't 
need to be compelled. And just because everybody else is doing it, you don't have to do it. You might have another path. It's just always to keep your own sovereignty like that, I think is is really helpful. So, you know, there were many components that went into that decision and it was excruciating. I mean, not- I mean, not. but how serendipitous that it, you know, it all kind of works out and then you end up there together in the end. Yeah, that's right. So my husband is now the viola professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah. So we're very, very incredibly fortunate as musicians. So, you know, I thank my lucky stars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you were talking about a little bit on, uh, or touching on having interests outside of music. You've done some studies as well, uh, you know, academic studies outside of music. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. I know some of that was while you're waiting for immigration stuff and um, you had some extra time, uh, but you know, why did you explore other paths and uh, what holds your interest outside of the flute? Yeah, why not? Why not is the answer. <laughs> um, yes, no, I, I love literature. I love, so, so of course, you know, my interest in music, I mean, I like the noise of the flute. But <laughs> it's, it's and it's a nice noise, but it, I'm yeah. more interested. I'm more interested in the sort of the imagination. That I'm more interested in that side of it than than flute playing. Do you see what I mean? I mean, yeah, I like. I get it. it. Yeah. It's a beautiful instrument, and it, it, there's something quite spiritual about it, and spirited about it. Um, so yeah, I just I'm always I'm always interested in learning from creative people too. So I love. You know, what we do on the flute is, you know, for the most part, you know, what people like, like, like me do is interpret, like we're interpreting what somebody else has written. I'm also very interested in that spark of creativity, like to make something up out of nothing. So I've done some writing courses and I love listening to authors and I love, uh, I, I just love stories. I love literature. I love books that take your breath away and 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 trans, you know, transport you to another world. And that's what we can do. Like when you play Brahms Symphony or you play Mahler Symphony, those epic things, you know, you want that to transport the listener, of course, out of the everyday and into this other world. And you know, what was it like? What was he going through? What what does it mean to be a human being? So, it's really just, um, I would say. It's very sympathetic to to what I'm doing in my professional life, you know, and and it helps to inspire me too, yeah. as well. You know, and uh, I also kind of wanted to talk about your husband. Uh, you brought him up a little bit ago, and your trio that you play in together. So, can you talk about forming that trio? And are you uh, the three of you um, still playing together today? My favorite way of making music is to do chamber music with friends, and so that trio, you know, we we we. We had many beautiful times and played at a lot of festivals. And our, you know, our our swan song was at was at the Edinburgh Festival, and it was so lovely. And so Heidi, the harpist, is a dear friend of ours. You know, she was living in Vancouver at the time. She was playing in Vancouver Opera, and and you know, then David and I moved to Pittsburgh. And Heidi's now in London. She plays in the Philharmonia Orchestra in London. So we just haven't had the chance to play together. But honestly, those the those concerts, some of those concerts are just my absolute favorite ways of making music because so spontaneous and we were, there's so much uh, trust and respect yeah. between the three of us that, you know, you could just, you could just turn a phrase and they would be listening and respond and vice versa. And so it was new every time. Like, I don't know how many times we played that Debussy trio, but it was new every time, you know, and, and so magical. So, so that, you know, that I think it's in Herodotus that said, you can't step into the same river twice. Yeah. So, so that, that that was it was always the case with that trio, and I'm I I I love I treasure those moments, and I'm, you know, that's what it's all about actually. So how do you kind of relate that and pull that into uh, the rehearsals uh, with the orchestra, the you know concerts in a row back to back, the kind of consistency of that? How do you bring that freshness and life to those? Okay, so I would say there's another skill there that you can learn, which is uh, a kind of give and take. And it's, I would say it's aligning yourself. So even if a conductor asks you to play something in a way that you think, that's not the way I feel it. Nevertheless, you try it and you don't just try it and you don't just execute it, but you make it your own. So you align, you align with that, but then you you find a way in into it, 
you know yeah. i think it's, i think it's through empathy i think i think that's a very uh you know i think i want to develop that in all my students and in my own playing is having that empathy okay i i don't hear it like that but let me try it and let me let me try and get right inside it and make it sound like it was my idea do you know what i mean that it's, so it's so it's convincing and compelling. So I'm not just doing a diminuendo where you want me to do a diminuendo. I, I, I'm making it more hushed, you know, to get a, that quality of character. So, so this comes back again to artist of the breath. So you're not just technically doing a diminuendo. You're sort of entering into the spirit of, of the way the conductor is maybe hearing it. Like they want it to sound perhaps a little bit more fragile than you, than you might want to play it. So, so thinking, uh, translating all these technical things into something human, so that our forties are never just technical. They're like, what kind of forty? Is it a joyful? Is it exuberant? Is it confident? Is it imposing? Is it even aggressive? Domineering? Like you have all these different nuances to play with, and so that's I think that the empathy, like, can I align with that way of thinking about this? and make it sound very human. Yeah, it still gives you a lot of um, room for creativity too on your own to figure out how you want it to go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Do you notice, um, you know, now playing with uh, Pittsburgh for, for many years, a difference between the American style and how you're playing in the BBC and a European style orchestra, rehearsals, concerts, and, and everything? I think there is a little bit more leeway for more soloistic playing in Europe. And I think that is what is invited and what is expected and what is, uh, so, uh, and, and you'll get, you'll get varying degrees of that, you know, sure. like, so if you think of the wind, you know, principles in, in Berlin Philharmonic, they're all great soloists. I mean, they're, they're incredible and they, um i'm not sure you would have that leeway in in american orchestras oh, not to the same degree and it's a slightly different expectations um and then and then of course there's a there's sort of degrees to that you know i think like one of my favorite orchestras to listen to is the royal concert about you know in amsterdam i know and i love emily Bynan's playing she's one oh, of my favorite players. i mean i love listening to berlin phil i, I love you know they're all, they're incredible. I mean, I just I love that. Um, so I I would say also in terms of the way auditions are structured, it invites it, it invites something different to come to the fore. So in Britain, for example, when I got my job in the BBC, you know there there was the big cattle call, and then they would then they would choose. I think there were 11 people that they chose to come in and do trials. Wow. And it, it's sort of like, if you know, the reality TV show Survivor. So they would <laughs> sort of rotate, rotate us in, you know, you'd get a week here, then another person will come in for a week. And then, you know, and, and gradually, you know, people would get voted off the island, so to say, and there'd be, there'd be one left. So yeah. that's, it's, a, and, and so that's, there's something a, a little bit more spacious about that because not everything is writing in the audition. So it, it makes the auditions not quite so careful and, right. and it invites a different way of playing that is not quite so defensive. Yeah, no, I mean, that makes sense. And I think you're the perfect kind of person to speak about this because not many people you know, are, are doing a lot of the crossover from European orchestras to American or you know, vice versa and get to play in both and have a lot of experience. So I think, you know, you have a unique perspective on that. And then, and then, you know, with other orchestras, you know, on con in continental Europe, let's leave Britain aside, right. um, where they would choose one winner, you know, they wouldn't do the whole trial system, but you get to play Mozart and then Eber or Reinecke, you know, you get, you get to kind of just spread your wings and just play a little bit. So it's not just exposition and then, you've got to draw right. your ex there's a little bit more again there's a little bit more spaciousness to actually a uh, play you yeah. know so so that invites that invites something different to come to come forward and it's not so 
uh, I think it's like not such a fragile um, it's not so stifling. It's not yeah. so stifling, actually. But but anyway, I don't want to criticize the the, the, the different sides. But it, it's just, I, you can you see what I mean about how it invites a different, yeah, relationship to the audition, and then, yeah, absolutely. Well, Thank you so much, Lorna. It was really a pleasure speaking with you and having you here on uh, Flute Unscripted. Thanks again. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you.